Greetings, comrades, and welcome to another episode. In fact, it's our 20th episode of Chatter in the Skull. And today we are going to talk intensively about the Russo-Ukraine War. As you will see this episode, it'll be, I guess, technically after the anniversary, but that will mark the official one-year anniversary of this horrific conflict. And it's just shocking to think that one year ago, there could have been potentially hundreds of thousands of people that did not know that they were going to eat a bloody end by this time next year, a bloody and violent end by this time next year. It's just horrific to think about. And the unfortunate reality is that it looks like this current status is going to continue well into 2023 and potentially beyond. But even though we have seen many horrific tragedies, we have seen some great miracles in the past year. If you had gone back one year ago and told me that Russia would be struggling this much in Ukraine, I wouldn't have believed you, to be quite honest. But today we are going to be spending not just time looking backwards, and we will be spending time doing that. But I want to look forward and see what 2023 will bring for this conflict. But for this episode, I want to ask and analyze something that has been, at least in my area, the kind of general attitude at this point in this current conflict amongst the population, which is that Ukraine is on track to win, that Ukrainian victory is inevitable, and it's just a matter of when, not if. And that is something that I want to answer in this episode today. Is Ukrainian victory inevitable at this point? And to answer that question, we are going to look at both the past and present to try as best as we can to ascertain the future. For me, at least, the definitive answer to this question, is Ukrainian victory inevitable, hinges on one thing, which is, is a Russian regroup and regrowth possible in this coming year? And we're going to spend some time analyzing that. We're going to be spending some time analyzing a lot of wars that the Russians have fought in previously and see if there's any rhymes that we can use to try and uh, parse out what may happen in the future. I think it's going to be a pretty fascinating dive for you guys. Got a lot of little interesting tidbits, especially if you like military history. Should be a pretty good episode for you. So we're going to look at these past conflicts and see which elements are representative of our time and which are not. So today we are going to be going over a number of conflicts that the Russians have fought previously because Russia has fought a lot of wars in its history. We're going to go over some winning and some losing and see what elements may differentiate the two and see if any of them are present here in our current scenario. Because one thing Russia has proven throughout its history is its capacity to take a punch and come back from mistakes. But the thing is, this doesn't happen all the time. Again, we're going to analyze some of the cases where that does happen and some of the cases where that doesn't actually happen. We've talked about this idea of cultural DNA on the show before. And when you think about Russian cultural DNA, you do get those images of tenacity and being able to stand up again after getting the crap beaten out of you type of thing. But one thing I want to stress here and talk about here and I think is something that gets overlooked in a lot of these kind of conversations is that the Russians are facing a people who have similar cultural DNA to them. They are facing a people that probably have all of those exact same traits and capabilities and have that kind of embedded tenacity and ability to continue moving forward and continue to stand up after taking a punch. So what I'm saying here is that when people talk about these things about Russia, they seem to assume that Ukraine doesn't have similar aspects. I would say that they have more than proven that they do have that toughness and that tenacity and that ability to keep going at this point. You know, I'm going to tell you guys a personal anecdote, and I guess I can because it is my show. I had this conversation, this is probably about four years ago, with this Ukrainian gentleman, he was older, in his early 50s, I would say. He's lived a life, he's been around, had some experience, but obviously he had moved from Ukraine over to Canada, and we were talking, and I was talking to him about Eastern European history and Russian history, because obviously I have an interest in the culture and the history of the region, and he told me something that I will never forget. 
and he made this fascinating argument that has always stuck with me. Basically, what he told me, to paraphrase, is that Ukrainian culture is the equivalent to Russian culture, which British culture is to American culture, or Greek culture is to Roman culture. So Ukrainian culture is the origin culture, the more sort of refined, sophisticated origin culture, which gets taken by a larger power and then dumped down and then exported to a large swath of territory. I probably made some people's heads explode with that one, but I remember like when I first heard it, I just thought that this guy's just a really proud Ukrainian. But the more and more I thought about it over the years, God damn, that guy was right. He was 100% right. In any case, with that out of the way, let us talk about the war which I would say is brought up the most in context of the Russo-Ukraine war and the war which people say, I, I guess would say, rhymes the most or has the most similarities to, which is, of course, the Winter War. So I just move myself over here so we can get a better look at some of these particulars here. But in case you do not know, we'll give you a brief background on the Winter War. So this war was fought. The nice thing about having Wikipedia. <laughs> so the information is right here. And I, I think that it's going to be important, especially for our discussion, to have at least as exact numbers as, as we can. And when it comes to sources for modern news or controversial topics, Wikipedia is a junk source. There's no question. But when it comes to information that's pretty much settled, that doesn't have a lot of controversy and is just kind of like settled truth or settled information, I think Wikipedia is a fantastic source and a good place to start. And it's going to be nice to have some of these figures right in front of us as we're talking. Sorry, brief background on the Winter War. Let's see if we can get a map here. I'm sure they'll have a map of exactly which territory. So we have a map of Europe. And effectively, the Russians were worried that the Finns had ter territory too close to Leningrad, now modern-day St. Petersburg. And effectively, they had, they had territory which was in artillery range, which was the big concern for the Russians. So they wanted to gain some of that territory back so they could have a buffer. And I think it's definitely a reasonable assumption to think that if the war had gone better for the Soviets, they may have just pushed on to Helsinki and attempted to install some sort of puppet government. But this war was very influential because it was apparently one of the main factors which drove Hitler to invade the Soviet Union. Their poor display in this war made him believe that it would be an easy task. And we'll, we'll get to that, don't worry. In any case, so yes, a lot of people I have seen discourse, both in person and online, draw similarities to the winter war so let's just take a brief look here at uh, in terms of overall strength you do have a, a weight for the soviets it's not known right whether the soviets outnumbered the finns two to one or maybe 1.5 to one but it's pretty clear that they had the advantage in manpower but not just that the overwhelming advantage in terms of tanks and aircraft as you can see finland only had 32 tanks at the time and 114 aircraft versus thousands for the Soviet Union. But when you get down to the casualties, that's the real kicker, right? You have about 26,000 just under dead or missing for the Finns. And in comparison, you have almost 10 times greater, well, maybe not that, but more like seven or eight times greater dead for the Soviet Union between 126,000 and 167,000 dead or missing. And then, of course, you pile on top of the wounded, which is another potentially 200,000. That's a huge casualty disparity. So in this war, it went extraordinarily poorly for the Russians initially. The Soviets' plan didn't go very well. Their troops were not very well supplied. They weren't taken care of. They were under-equipped, under-trained. This is, of course, also after Stalin's purges. So the Soviet army was particularly weak and inept in its leadership core. So this was an initial absolute disaster for the Soviet unions. The Finns crushed them. They crushed their unorganized columns. And that was a big thing that when the columns of Russian tanks and supply vehicles were stuck on the road to Kiev early in the war, 
people were making analogies, especially very much so to the Winter War, because that was something that happened with tanks, with trucks. The Russians, the Soviets left them very vulnerable to attack, and the Finns would use their home field advantage. They would use troops on skis effectively to come in and raid these columns and get out very quickly. And they had these ski raiding groups. It's very, very fascinating here. Very fascinating use of tactics in the war. And it was extraordinarily effective for the Finns and really bloodied the Soviets as a result. But the thing about the Winter War is that even though the Soviets did really get bloodied and they did really get beaten and took some pretty humiliating losses, they achieved their strategic goals. Again, we don't really know. There's no paper documentation as far as we know that the Soviets were planning to annex the country. Although I definitely think it's reasonable to assume that, again, if this war had gone well, definitely a high possibility they may have tried to annex and put a Soviet-friendly government in Finland. That being said, eventually the Soviets did adapt to their tactics. They eventually brought in enough troops to the point where the Finns could effectively see the writing was on the wall. And if the war continued for a longer period of time, eventually the Russians would win and overwhelm them, which brought both sides to a mutually agreeable peace terms where the Finns would cede some of that key territory the Soviets want, wanted in exchange for not being attacked again. So the Russians were able to muster enough of their force to show the Finns that they would eventually lose the war if it continued, although it would be at great cost for the Russians or the Soviets, and ended in said peace. There's a couple of key differences between this and what we're facing in the Russo-Ukrainian war now. One thing is, is that right now in Russia's mind or Russia, the Russian state's mind, this is a very high stakes war. The Russians effectively believe that they are battling for their future as a country, or at least the Russian government does. And the Russian government, the Russian state is right now very effectively tied to one man. And yes, he perceives this as a very high stakes existential struggle for Russia. Whereas for the Soviet Union, this was more of an afterthought, just something that they wanted to gain a little bit of extra territory, a little buffer territory for one of their major cities. And it ended up not going very well at the start, but eventually they had enough resources that they could overcome their obvious deficiencies. And the other major difference is that 2022 Ukraine is a much stronger foe and much more capable foe than 1939 Finland. I know that might sound a little bit sacrilegious to say, but in terms of population, the Ukrainians have much more population. They're an industrialized country that has access to advanced weaponry from the West, something that Finland didn't have. They, of course, had some access to weapons from Germany and a little bit from uh, other sources but nothing like what Ukraine has access to right now. So it is, in Russia's mind, a more important struggle against a more powerful enemy. And as a result of that, effectively, I do think that the Russians are going to escalate this war as much as they can. And this is one of the big things I think we're going to see inside of Russia moving into this year is a much more sustained propaganda force to try and escalate this war and ease people as softly as they possibly can, which is not an easy thing to do, into a second mobilization wave if it's not already happening. So because Ukraine sees no reason to cede any of its territory in this current circumstance, because it doesn't see the writing on the wall inevitably as Finland did, Russia is not the same economy either. That's one thing I forgot to mention. The Soviet economy of 1939 is not the same as the Russian economy of 2022. This is a time when the Russians had access to massive pools of material and for its time, extremely advanced equipment. Again, they do not have such pools and reserves. And not only that, they don't really have the capacity to replenish the reserves that they have with their current economy. So again, because Ukraine is in a stable position, 
and Russia is in a not a stable position. Ukraine doesn't really feel the need to sue for peace or give up any of its territory. And also, because Russia sees the stakes of this war as extraordinarily high, they have no interest in giving up or backing down. And we talked about this in our episode about Crimea. Do you have a point where you have the unstoppable force meets the immovable object? We've got these two forces that are in no way going to give ground, clashing against each other. So, in the sense, it's not like the Winter War that you can expect a quick peace deal to follow. It's going to grind on for a much longer period of time. And another big difference, I think, is that, well, yes, it was an absolute disaster for Russia at the start. There's no question. They adapted enough to overcome that and effectively, again, achieve what they wanted to. I think it's an open question whether or not Russia can adapt and overcome that ability to adapt and overcome came from a vast pool of men and materials and sophisticated technology that doesn't compare for current day Russia. So in terms of relevance to our current day conflict, I think the winter war is a little bit overrated. So let's move on to our next example. The next example we're going to be going over is the Polish Soviet war. So the Soviet Polish war is a fascinating piece of history and a very impactful piece of history, very underrated in terms of how much it's taught and known about into the actual impact that it had. So to talk about the setup for the Soviet-Polish War, it's immediately after World War I. It's 1919. The Russian Revolution is effectively still happening. The Russian Civil War is ongoing. So this war bleeds into the Russian Civil War a little bit, or, well, Bleeds out of, I guess, is, is maybe better in any case. So, effectively, after World War I, the old Russian Tsarist Empire was forced to give up large tracts of its territory in the Treaty of brest litovsk to Germany, and the new Russian government wanted it back. So, a lot of these emerging countries are emerging directly out of the treaty of brest because not only now, this treaty now no longer has any effect because Germany has lost the war. So you have these kind of independent nations now just trying to grow up out of nowhere and not really having a lot of support or anything like that. So it's a really tenuous situation, a really chaotic situation. Civil war happening in Russia, new countries emerging out of nowhere. And in this chaos, what happens is, it, honestly, the details are lost to time. But there's a escalating series of skirmishes on the border between Poland and the red-controlled Soviet Union, which eventually become the full Soviet Union later in the war. Through these series of escalating, so through these series of escalating skirmishes, what happens is that Poland goes on the offensive. And let's see if we can get a good map here of the Polish offensive. What's this? Nope, this is the partitions of Poland. <laughs> Important to know, definitely, for the historical context. This looks good, even though it's in fucking French. Who gives a shit? Okay, so this is during the Civil War, when the Reds are expanding and grabbing territory, and you have these newly formed Baltic republics, and, of course, Poland itself. And then what happens is that through these border skirmishes, eventually Poland takes the offensive and they start to move into Russia. And initially, progress is pretty good. In fact, they don't have a lot of initial resistance because there's a civil war happening in Russia. So the Poles make a ton of progress. In fact, I believe they advance all the way up to Kiev. Yes, yeah, they advance all the way up to Kiev. They take Minsk, take Vilnius. They gain a huge swath of territory in this time. But what happens is eventually the Russians counterattack. The civil war ends, and now the Russians are able to focus their efforts on Poland as a whole. So what happens is that once they get their armies together, they've been doing a little bit of a buildup, they get their armies together and they counterattack and pretty swiftly move the Poles back, and they actually have Ukrainian elements with them because this area 
near Lvov was effectively a kind of Ukrainian mini state. So they also had a Ukrainian element supporting this Polish army. So in any case, the Reds regroup, they push the Poles back, they take back Kiev, they take back Minsk. And there's like a weird moment where the Red Army doesn't really know what it's supposed to do. The two major offensive generals for the Red Army in this are actually Stalin, the Stalin, and Marshal Tukhachevsky, who is one of the major architects of the Soviet Grand Battle Doctrine. So anyway, these two generals are moving in. Stalin's in the south, Tukhachevsky's in the north, and Tukhachevsky is more ambitious than Stalin, and he ends up running forward with his army and just pushing forward where Stalin kind of just chills and lets him go forward. So there's kind of a, a point where Tukhachevsky is going rogue in this moment because there's conflicting information of whether or not the heads back in Moscow wanted this to happen or were encouraging this to happen, or they were afraid more of the clout and army that this guy had. So they just let him do his thing either way. So this moment where maybe he goes rogue and he overextends his supply chains. And due to that, effectively what happens is this opens them up to the Polish counterattack, which basically right outside Warsaw, Tukhachevsky and his army are halted. Again, they've outstripped their supply lines and they're not getting any support. Stalin's just chilling there. And what happens is what happens to a lot of Russian armies, but they outstrip their supply lines. They get surrounded and destroyed. And effectively, this uh, Polish offensive pushes the Russians completely out of Polish territory. They end up regaining some of their territory and securing independence for a lot of the Balkan states. And this Polish offensive basically forces the Soviets to the table and they sign a peace treaty. They sign the Treaty of Riga and then we can look and that sets the borders of Poland until 1939 and the start of World War II. So there you go. Soviet-Polish War, super interesting, really impactful. And how does it pertain to our war today? So when it comes to this war, this was a pretty decisive Russian defeat. There's no question that they effectively they lost, they lost even some of their territory to the Poles. So it was a pretty sizable victory for the Polish army. No question about it. And I think that when we look at a decisive defeat like this and what enabled it to happen, one of the things you do have to take into account was the fact that Russia is just recovering from a civil war. This war actually happens in the midst of the Russian civil war. So there probably is not as much will in Moscow to engage in continual fighting with another foreign power. And you also run the risk of you escalate this war. Maybe there's intervention from Western Europe. And this is one thing that apparently Trotsky was worried about when it came to the Polish Soviet war. <laughs> God damn it. I spilled water on myself. Anyway, you have a ball in Moscow that is much less willing to engage in prolonged warfare. But one of the things that is really interesting about this war in particular is that the first offensive was initiated by the Poles and they did, again, they did very well going all the way to Kiev. And I feel like that if that had happened, if Ukraine had started pushing into Russian territory in a similar manner, that at that point you risk angering the Russian population because now they feel like they're under attack and now all of a sudden Vladimir Putin can justify anything, essentially once Russian soil is actually under attack, not this fig leaf of annexed territory that's now apparently Russian soil. Yeah, okay. Once actual Russian soil gets attacked, then he has the means to justify just about anything he wants. So I don't think that that would be the best move on Ukraine's part. Well, the one interesting way that I do think that this particular war can be similar. It's not necessarily similar now, but I think it could be similar in the sense is that in that initial offensive, or excuse me, in that second offensive, I guess you could say in the initial offensive, Poland retook pretty much all the territory that it had had after it had been carved out of the Treaty of Bespotosk. It had regained pretty much all of its territory from the Soviet Union. Although I'm sure if you were to ask some Polish ultranationalists at the time, they may have disagreed. But that being said, the Poles were able to push the Russians completely out of their territory. So I think that if the Ukrainians were able to do something here, you could definitely force some sort of peace. 
and a defeat for Russia, which would definitely be similar to the Polish-Soviet War. So that is one way that these conflicts could end up being similar to one another. And with that being said, let's move on to this next entry we have into our annals of Russian wars. Let's talk about another one. I know this one is a definite Russian victory, which is the Soviet Union in World War II. And this is one that Putin is actively trying to hearken back to and, and say, this is the Nazi regime in Ukraine. we got to take them out type of thing. It's just like World War II, we're fighting Nazis again. So obviously he's trying to hearken back to this tradition with, with a victory in the Second World War. But when it comes to the Second World War and Soviet Union Second World War, there are massive differences. The most glaring and obvious one being the Soviet Union was on the defensive in World War II. They were clearly attacked by the Germans. They were clearly attacked without a real declaration of war. They broke the non-aggression pact, an obvious act of aggression. Very similar to what I would argue that Russia has done to Ukraine, or they just basically drove all their tanks across the border without a real declaration of war or anything. In fact, they just called it a special military operation. They still haven't really declared war on Ukraine. So obviously a massive difference in that regard. And that gave the Soviet Union the opportunity to deploy absolutely every conceivable measure in defense of its home territory. So because of that, the Russians and the Soviet Union were able to access all of their resources and all of their manpower and mobilize it completely in the defense of their country and the defeat of Nazi Germany, where Nazis obviously had to fight on multiple fronts. But in one sense, you can argue, at least at this point, that that is similar for Russia, because right now Russia is mobilizing all of its military force in fighting one singular enemy. This isn't a world war, thankfully, knock on wood, at least not yet. So there's not multiple adversaries coming from every single angle. Obviously, Ukraine is getting supplies and lend-lease and equipment from NATO, but there's no hot war between NATO and Russia as of yet. And again, hopefully there won't be. But what is the main differentiating factor here is that Putin may see this as an existential conflict, but that doesn't mean all of Russia does, at least not yet. So he can't just flip the switch and be like mass mobilization. All of our military is turning to production of war equipment. All of our manpower is going into the funding of this war and defense of our country. Can't do that. He can't just up and change Russian society like that. As much power as he does have, there are certain limits that if he were to cross, you would get massive uprising. So one of the things, and again, we talked about it in one of our other analogies, is that I do see Russia continually escalating its propaganda and trying to slowly mobilize as much of its resources as it can into this war without destabilizing the kind of bubble that they have built around a lot of, especially Russian urban centers. And another thing here is you have the ideology of totalitarian communism in the Soviet Union, which allows Stalin to basically utilize, again, all of the resources of the state to win the war. And that is something that Vladimir Putin does not have. But I guess the main similarity here, and this is a similarity in pretty much all of the wars we're going to be talking about, is an abysmal start for the Russians. They virtually always start every war in just terrible shape. And that is one of the things that we need to be looking for this year because you'll notice a pattern in the wars where the Russians do turn it around. It takes about a year, sometimes 18 months, I would say in World War II's case, probably closer to that 18 month mark for the Soviets to really turn it around. But they have the capacity, they've done it before, but in order to do that, they tap into their massive pool of resources and manpower, and they've tapped into it a lot of times in their history. And I don't know, in my personal opinion, I think the well is starting to run dry and there might not be a whole lot more that the Russian state can extract. So that's one of the things to look for. What are the factors that enable a Russian turnaround? 
and in World War II's case, it was poor planning for the Germans as they did not plan for a long war. And then, of course, the ability of Russia to finally begin to utilize and mobilize its industrial capacity for warfare. So when you're talking about world wars, if you got to talk about two, I think you should always talk about one. Because one of the things I think World War One is actually a more interesting story and a more dynamic story than World War II. What World War II really has going for it that World War One doesn't have as much are these like really dynamic titans and characters and personality driven people that took the reins of history in that particular era. But going back to the Russians in World War I, this one I think is, is again a pretty clear loss for Russia, although the way it lost was more of a collapse in upon itself. This was a scenario where the Russian Tsar, you know, and eventually he ended up taking overall command of the Russian forces and tying in self to the progress of the war, the Russian Tsar's performance was so utterly abysmal that it was the final nail in a series of nails in the coffin for the Russian Tsardom, which ended up in the collapse of the government and the ascension of the Bolsheviks and the Soviet Union within Russia. But what's interesting about Russia in this circumstance and in World War I is that on paper, Russia has all of the capacity to be a huge threat, to be an absolute demonic force. And this is something that the Germans were seriously worried about. You can go back and read some of their heads of state and great thinkers and diplomats they are thinking about Russia. In fact, Otto von Bismarck, his biggest and most important piece of advice to Kaiser Wilhelm II was keep Russia on your side. But the Germans were obviously worried about the industrial capacity of Russia and the population of Russia at this time. And those were two of its big crutches, which modern day Russia does not have, at least not in the same way that Tsarist Russia at that point had. Because the empire of the Tsar at that time outstripped the Soviet Union, at least in its actual borders, because they had a Finland, for example, was part of the Russian Empire at that time. So you're talking about a time when the Russians had even more power, potentially you could argue at the height of their power, but they performed so abysmally in this war that it effectively, again, was the final nail which led to a complete collapse of their current form of government. Super interesting. So I guess the question in similarity for us in modern times is that going into this war, a lot of us, including myself, and I'll admit that, had a perception of Russia maybe in a similar way that the Germans did back in the 1900s, which is that Russia had at least a powerful army on paper and it could do a lot of damage. And while we didn't have the same demographic woes that they did at that time, there was an understanding that Russia was the second best military and really had something going for it. And then when the actual rubber meets the road, we're seeing that a lot of that was just talk and bluster and had been slowly sapped out by the one pervasive force, which has sapped out the energy of the Russian people for almost their entire existence, which is pervasive government corruption. And to Russia's credit, they did perform pretty well against the Austro-Hungarians, but not so well against the Germans in this war. And the, another similarity I do think, and when it comes to whether or not this is offense or defensive war, it's an interesting question because I think you can make an argu argument honestly for either one. But as most people know, the entanglement of alliances brought Russia into the First World War. So again, both sides, I think, were able to argue that they were fighting a defensive war. Regardless, though, where I do think that World War One can be similar is in the sense that Vladimir Putin, I do think, has really tied his government to the outcome of this war in the same way that Tsar Nicholas has, or had, more rather. And if the outcome of this war goes poorer and poorer, and people become more and more upset, it could definitely end up breaking the Russian government, breaking Vladimir Putin, and ushering in some sort of replacement. I don't know if we're going to get another Russian revolution, nothing like that but we would get some sort of obvious new leadership. And in this case, we do have another example of Russia performing poorly at the start, but we don't really have them bouncing back. 
We do have some instances of them performing very well. For example, the Bruce Law Offensive, widely regarded as an exemplary operation by the Russians at the time, gained a lot of ground and did a lot of damage to mainly the Austro-Hungarians. But I think why they couldn't turn around in that case was the lack of industrial capacity and the lack of logistical equipment and logistical ability to supply your massive armies. You've got these massive armies that are under-equipped, under-trained, can't really communicate with one another. And some of these problems were never solved for the Russians, but you, they couldn't even begin to solve them until industrial technology like roads and radios and those sort of things to help ease some of those issues. So I am unfortunately running longer than I would like to. So I'm going to jump to our next example and I think this might be our last example, which is the Crimean War. One thing that's interesting is that Russia is fighting on its home territory, one of the few defeats that it has on its home territory. But one of the things I think is really interesting about the Crimean War is the casualty numbers. As you can see, the Russians took about twice the casualties as, we'll just call them the allies, quote unquote, for our purposes. They took about twice the casualties, and again, on their home turf. And this was one of the circumstances where the Russians were doing so badly and so many people were dying that effectively the will to continue the war broke for both the state and the people involved. And the one major takeaway I want you guys to take away from the Crimean War, which this was a war fought to prevent Russian expansion. They were worried that the Russians would expand. They, meaning France and Britain, were worried that the Russians would overexpand overtake the Ottoman Empire and they're worried about them getting too big and too powerful. So they were trying to cut them down to size. There's a lot more than that, but again, moving on how it can be reflective of the current crisis is that it is emblematic of one of the things that keeps me up at night. And one of the things that makes me think that Ukrainian victory is not necessarily inevitable. And the main thing is Russia's capacity to take casualties and its capacity to endure wars of attrition. In this case, we're talking about a loss ratio of two to one before they finally capitulated and said, okay, this is enough is enough. We can't do this anymore. So when I think about what's happening right now in Ukraine, we're going to end with a little bit of a looking forward. What do I think will happen? But when it comes to what is happening right now in Ukraine and the fighting we're seeing around Bakhmut, we're seeing very clear indications of a war of attrition which actually favors Russia in the long term because they have more people, they have more stuff. So even if the Ukrainians are, and I definitely think that the Ukrainians are getting the better of the Russians in the battle of attrition for Bakhmut, the thing is that even if they're achieving two to one casualties in this, like in this circumstance, it might not be enough. They might have to be achieving a three to one or four to one. If Russia and the Russian state is very committed to this war, which at this point I think they are, the Ukrainians are going to have to inflict a lot of casualties if historical record is any precedence. And if we look at the casualty, the reported casualty ratios for Russia right now, it seems that historical precedent will hold up in this case and there will be the ability to sustain a lot of casualties for the Russians. The thing, again, that keeps me up at night is that that war of attrition even if on paper the Ukrainians are doing well and really well, the fact of the matter that because Russia has so much more stuff, eventually they could grind them down in that war of attrition. And that is one of the things I do think that they're trying to do in Bakhmo currently. And before I move on, I want to say the key reason why the Russians weren't able to turn this war around was again, real failure of supply in this case. They actually had poor supply than the invaders because their road system into Crimea was so poor and so backwards that the British and the French and the Ottomans could just use their Navy, sail up to the port or whatever, and use their naval power effectively to supply their armies where the Russians really couldn't do that in their own home territory. That's a big factor for when Russia isn't able to actually win, isn't able to come back. It's because they can't overcome a lot of their logistics and supply issues. And this so far looks like it is holding true in Ukraine that 
logistics and supply issues are crippling the Russians to a, a very severe degree. To bring this back, we're going to answer our question and we're going to end with a look of what might happen in 2023. Is the Ukrainian victory inevitable at this point? Is the Ukrainian momentum hefty and so massive that the Russians simply cannot resist it? To answer that question, I would say <laughs> it's really tough to, to see the future. But at this point, I think that a Ukrainian victory, well, not inevitable, does seem very likely at this point in time. The historical signs to a Russian turnaround do not seem to be there, at least in my opinion. Obviously, I can be proven wrong. Russia, again, has shown the capacity to endure and adapt and eventually overcome. But with what we saw today and what history has shown for Russian capabilities in the past, I'm just not seeing the ingredients there for a Russian turnaround. Obviously, this does mean, not mean to say that the war is over by any stretch of the imagination. There is going to be a lot of fighting and tragedy and conflict yet to come. But I do think that the momentum is on Ukraine's side right now, and they will retain that momentum, as far as I can see, into 2023. So let's talk about what I think 2023 will bring us and what we're going to see in this war. Like I alluded to in the past, I think we are going to see more Russian escalation, which in turn will mean more Ukrainian escalation, which in turn will mean more aid from the West to continue the fight. And I do predict that this year we'll see the war be more violent than in 2022. I think 2023 will be bloodier and will be more savage than last year, unfortunately to say. But right now where we are, most of the fighting is happening around Bakhmud. This has been happening again for the last couple months. The one thing again to stress is that, well, yes, most of the fighting is happening here. This is like a World War I frontline where action at a low level is happening everywhere constantly. So while yes, most of the fighting is happening here, there are still people fighting and dying everywhere all along the front line currently. Anyway, moving into Bakhmud, what we're seeing is, I think, an indication of Russia trying to play to its strengths, trying to play to an attritional warfare here, and also really doing the only kind of advance that they possibly can, given the current climate and weather conditions in Ukraine. Again, this is the one-year anniversary, and one of the things we learned last year is that mud and vehicles do not mix very well that very conditions in Ukraine are not conducive to armored assaults. And the winter that Ukraine is having right now is actually warmer than last year. So there's more mud, so less usable terrain for armored vehicles. That realistically means the only type of assault you could do are small scale infantry based assaults, which can't gain a lot of ground quickly. They have to gain ground slowly, but surely over time. And this is something that, again, favors the Russians because they can lose two to one, they can lose three to one, and still end up winning the war in the long run. So it seems that the Russians have at least learned their lesson from last year that they are not going to drive their vehicles down the middle of open road and, and use them to try and assault over muddy terrain. Seems that the Russians have learned that lesson. And right now they are applying the only type of offensive force that they can realistically apply, which is infantry-based offensives. Probably they can only muster it in one area. And th it, theoretically, I don't think the Russians can muster another attack right now. I think most of their forces and most of their offensive capability is concentrated here. And that brings me to Ukraine itself, because we've been pretty quiet on the front of the actual Ukrainian armed forces since the liberation of Kherson. I feel like we don't really know. We haven't really heard a hide or hair out of the Ukrainian army as to what their plans are. We don't really have a lot of indication of where they might go, which I think is for the best. Right now, it makes sense for the Ukrainians to adopt a defensive posture through the winter until eventually the terrain hardens up and they're able to use mobile vehicles once again because they had a lot of success in both the Kharkiv and Kyrgyzstan with combined arms using mechanized troops, air force, artillery, everything together 
that is what led to those successful counter offensives. And right now they can't use some of that equipment. So they're adopting a defensive posture, doing their best to try and grind out the Russians until they're able to actually once again, use their armored vehicles and conduct more combined armed offensives, which is something I think we're going to see spring, April, May, depending on the weather. So I, I expect for the most part, until the end of the winter, we are going to be looking at Bakhmut. We're going to be talking about Bakhmut until the weather changes. And at that point, I think that we will see a much larger Ukrainian counteroffensive but for the Russians, I do think right now they are going to adopt a long-term bleed them out strategy and try and take small victories where they can and get it. I don't think we're going to see anything like we saw last year with kind of like large armored columns trying to do a kind of a, a spearhead into Ukraine. I don't think we're going to see that. Again, I think the Russians have adapted their tactics beyond that now. So what I expect is that they may launch some grand offensive maybe later this year. I don't think that they'll have much of a capability to do much more than one or two real grand offensives. But I think right now the main goal for the Russians is to bleed out Ukraine as much as they possibly can. And it's a tactic that if applied over a long enough period of time will probably prove to be effective. And that, again, is my biggest worry, is that how long can Russia continue to grind and, and how long can Ukraine to be ground upon? That is what is going to be the defining feature, especially of this year and moving into, hopefully not, but I, I think probably that the war will extend until 2024 even. The only real downside to this strategy for the Russians is that they will need to point to victories to keep morale for not just their army, but the population up. And it's a lot more difficult to point to victories in this very slow, grindy type of warfare. And, and that's something we saw in World War I. There wasn't a lot of victories for any of the sides to point to, unless you count the Germans that are talking about Eastern Front victories. But you, they will need something to keep that morale and fire alive in order to make mobilizing the population an easier task. So in terms of that, I'm not 100% sure what they can do, if they can do anything. But right now, I think the Russians are going to continue to pursue this war of attrition style and this war of attrition strategy. And that's going to bring us to the end of our discussion on the Russo-Ukraine war for now. With our one-year update, again, unfortunately, I wish I had more optimistic news for you guys. But really, I, I just see the war grinding on for the continuation of this year and probably into next year. So unfortunately, I don't mean to end it on a dire note, but I again, I don't have a feel-good story for you guys. I feel bad. I've skipped it two weeks. I just hope that people take time today to think about the victims of this war, to reflect on how the world has changed. And if you can, volunteer, give help out to any kind of Ukrainian-based charity that you can. And I know maybe in some ways it's cold and sterile to sit here and look at maps and talk about this long past because right now real people are fighting and real people are dying. And in that way, I hope we really don't forget the human aspect and the human loss and the human tragedy that this war has brought on the people that it's impacted. Anyway, with that is going to be the end of this episode for me. I'm sorry to begin and things on a downer, but unfortunately... It's pretty tough to, I don't know. I've been asked what I think about the black pill. And I definitely am black pilled sometimes. And sometimes when I think about this war, talk about this war, it is tough for me not to get a little black pilled, even though it does look like Ukraine is winning and doing well. The fact of the matter is that there is still going to be so much more tragedy ahead. That's the world we live in right now. So anyway, guys, take care. Take care of yourselves. Take care of your loved ones. Until next time, this has been Comrade. Signing off for now, and you guys take care.